Good morning. I'm Vicki Wynn in for Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin with the war in Ukraine breaking overnight. More civilian casualties from heavy shelling by the Russians in key cities. Ukrainian officials say at least one person was killed and several others injured after a missile hit a multi-story apartment building yesterday in the outskirts of Kyiv. And in besieged Mariupol, officials say Russian forces bombed a theater there that was sheltering more than a thousand people. The death toll is still unknown. But this morning, according to a post on Facebook by a Ukrainian official, some people are emerging from the rubble alive. It appears Russia's military progress has been stalled. UK defense officials saying Russian forces are suffering heavy losses from Ukrainian resistance. All this as a war of words unfolds. President Biden calling Russian President Vladimir Putin a war criminal for the first time as he comments and it commits another $800 million in military support for Ukraine. I want to be honest with you. This could be a long and difficult battle. But the American people will be steadfast in our support of the people of Ukraine. And this morning, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky now pleading with Germany's parliament for help. One day after an impassioned address to Congress, Zelensky addressing fears of another world war with our own Lester Holt. Do you agree that it wouldn't take much to end up in World War III? Well, nobody knows whether it may have already started. NBC News correspondent Molly Hunter begins our coverage this morning from Lviv. Good morning, Molly. President Zelensky addressed Germany's parliament earlier today, one day after speaking to our Congress. He appeared to be a little critical of Germany in his remarks. Tell us more about that speech. Yeah, not just a little critical. It was scathing, and he still got a standing ovation. So as you say, this is one day after, of course, he addressed the Congress, where he also got a standing ovation. But he basically blasted Germany for being complicit in Russia's war through their Russian business ties, through their indecision, through their lack of leadership. He said, we saw how many connections your companies still maintain with Russia, your country, and some other countries as well. We are asking you to act as the aggressor sees you as a power and not that you're just thinking about the economy, the economy, the economy. And he addressed German Chancellor Scholz directly to say, give Germany the leader that they deserve. Molly, Mariupol has been one of the worst hit cities in this conflict. Ukrainian officials have accused Russia of bombing a theater and a swimming pool that was sheltering civilians. Russia has denied carrying out that attack. What can you tell us about this incident and how are the humanitarian efforts going in that city? Yeah, this was the big headline overnight. So it was a drama theater, and apparently it was in the heart of what was once a very vibrant section of Mariupol. That is that southeast city uh, on the Black Sea that we have been talking about for the last two weeks that has been besieged by the Russians, 450,000 people basically being starved out. Well, this theater was a refuge for civilians. But next to this theater, uh, we see in pictures, satellite images by Maxar, they had written kids in white writing, in the Russian language wow. so that from the air you can quite easily see that kids uh, are staying there. Now our understanding is that 1,200 people were sleeping there. Uh, we are hearing reports, as you mentioned in the open, about possibly survivors, but we don't have any kind of death toll uh, or real numbers yet to share. That is so heartbreaking. Molly, we are also hearing that one person has died in the capital, Kyiv, after the remains of a downed missile hit a residential building there. What's the latest on that? Yeah, and this has been happening for the last several nights, as our Richard Engel has been reporting in the capital of Kyiv. Now, according to the Ukrainian military, they have stalled uh, Russian ground forces, so tanks and ground troops outside some of these cities that they have uh, attacked heavily and besieged, like Mariupol, like Volnavaha, like Kharkiv, and like the capital city. What's happening now, because those troops have stalled, is they are firing rockets, they are firing attacks, they are firing missiles into the center of these cities indiscriminately, hitting civilian targets, like apartment buildings, uh, like metro stops, like a railway station. Uh, in Zaporizhia yesterday, they hit a botanical garden, things with no military infrastructure mm. in any way around. These could not be confused for military targets. The Russians are now sending indiscriminate attacks into city centers, civilian centers, and the civilian death toll because of that is going up inside Kyiv. Molly, these are some of the terrible war crimes that Russia is being accused of. Thank you so much for your reporting. We'll catch up with you a little later in the show.
Now, after his emotional message to Congress yesterday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke with our own Lester Holt to discuss the state of his country as the Russian invasion continues. Here's Lester with more. I spoke to Ukraine's President Zelensky in an NBC News exclusive interview with the help of a Ukrainian government-provided translator. I'd like to begin by asking you the status of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. There's been some reporting that uh, the framework of a deal is being hammered out, one in which you would renounce NATO ambitions, declare neutrality, not allow uh, foreign militaries to base on your land. Can you confirm any of that and update us on the status of negotiations? Well, thank you for this question, Lester. First of all, the negotiations are still in progress. The negotiations are fairly difficult. Um, and the current conditions of negotiation, I would say, it continues. Any war uh, could be finished at the table of negotiations. You delivered a very passionate speech uh, to Congress. You once again renewed your call for a no-fly zone. As you know, that's a non-starter in this country. But you also made the pitch uh, for an alternative, and that's the fighter planes. Do you think that President Biden is inching closer to perhaps reconsidering uh, transferring fighter planes to Ukraine? Well, this is the choice for the President Biden to, 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 to take, and the whole civilized world to, would need to take. And hopefully, that choice would coincide with the choice of, of the Ukrainian people, because currently, uh, Russia has uh, um, an advantage in the air. Our partners can support us from the standpoint of, of supporting and supplying of those aircrafts. President Biden has been very clear he's worried about provocations that could trigger World War III. Do you understand his concern there, and do you agree that it wouldn't take much to end up in World War III? Well, nobody knows whether it may have already started and what is the possibility of uh, uh, this war if uh, Ukraine will fall, in case Ukraine will fall. It's very hard to say. And we've seen this 80 years ago when the, the Second World War has started. And there were similar tragedies in the history. Nobody would be able to predict when the full-scale war would start and how it will end and who will end, put an end to that. In any case, the wars uh, tend to end up in millions of people lost. Uh, people die in millions of uh, uh, buildings destroyed. Now we have different technologies, nuclear weapons. In this case, we have the, civ the whole civilization at stake. The U.S. administration has raised concerns that Russia might launch a chemical attack. Do you think there is a red line and whether that would be a red line that the U.S. would move forward and become more actively involved in combat? I believe that Russians have already crossed all the red lines when they started shelling um, civilians. They've killed hundred, over a hundred of children. And uh, I don't understand the meaning of uh, red lines. What else should they, we wait for? For letting Russians kill 200, 300 or 400 uh, children. And then I asked him about the fate of Ukraine's capital, the city where he still is tonight, with the Russian onslaught intensifying. If Kyiv falls to the Russians, does the entire country of Ukraine fall to the Russians? Well, our people are unconquerable. And this is uh, what our people have clearly demonstrated. You can conquer the city, you can broke the heart, but you won't be able uh, to uh, force anyone to love uh, someone. That is why the heart will always remain with the Ukrainians. President Zelensky hosted three European leaders earlier this week. I asked him whether he has invited President Biden. He replied he would be happy to do so.
Lester Holt, thank you so much again, interviewing him right after addressing Congress. Pretty amazing. Powerful remarks. Well, let's dig a little deeper into the situation in Ukraine with Joe Cirincioni. He's a nuclear expert and a distinguished fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Joe, good morning. You said in a recent interview that we are closer to the risk of nuclear use mm. than at any time since the 1980s. Yesterday, President Biden called Putin, quote, a war criminal, which then Moscow called unacceptable and unforgivable. My question is, at this point, is it wise to use rhetoric like that? Mm. Or does the world need to call a spade a spade and take action to stop Putin? I've read that, you know, sometimes with a bully, you have to speak bully. Use language Putin understands. What do you think, Joe? I think President Biden is speaking the simple truth. It's been obvious to most of us since the beginning of this war that Putin is engaged in multiple war crimes. Remember, it's against the law of war, the so-called Geneva Conventions, to shell civilians indiscriminately, to target civilian infrastructure, to attack uh, nuclear power plants. There's a whole separate law against attacking civilian nuclear power plants. Uh, these are war crimes, and Putin is the one directing this war. I think Biden's accurate and uh, and is correct to be calling him out at this point. I hope the U.S. will go further and actually bring war crime charges against Putin during the war before the International Criminal Court. Such an important distinction there. There really is a difference just between these things that we're seeing that look awful and an actual war crime. Now, Joe, that, of course, was this escalation of rhetoric from Washington, but we are also seeing this new supply of military aid. But Russia previously warned the U.S. that it's acting dangerously by supplying weapons to Ukraine. And, and I think a lot of people are confused about what these lines are. I think it's pretty clear how a no-fly zone, the enforcement of that, puts American and NATO forces head-to-head -head with Russian forces, so that makes sense. But this line about weapons or this line about jets seems blurrier. Are you concerned that this $800 million package raises the risk of U.S. being dragged into a conflict with Russia? Or do you think a concern like that even is just essentially allowing Putin to make the rules? Uh, well, you know, the rules actually are d just prescribed in international law. If you are aiding one side in a war, technically you're a co-belligerent. That is, you're involved in the war effort. Um, and the distinction that's being made is not really a legal one, but a military mm -hmm. one. Most experts would draw the line at heavy equipment, heavy weaponry, like jet fighters, like tanks, like armored vehicles. The kind of aid we've been giving them, however, is actually more effective. It's more the mm. things that they need. This is very sophisticated equipment. These, these javelins, these stingers, these other anti-armor weapons, these new switchblade drones, so-called kamikaze drones, that are in this $800 million package are extremely effective. I just heard a Ukrainian lawmaker on your network yesterday talking about her friend, her teacher, was mm. teaching school three weeks ago, is now carrying a Javelin anti-tank missile. They're sophisticated, but part of that sophistication is that they're very easy to use. Mm. Think of them like your iPhone, a very sophisticated piece of machinery, but very simple to operate and deadly to Ukrainian forces. I think these weapons, plus the tenacity and morale of the Ukrainian forces, are why you see the Russian offensive stalled and why you see Ukrainian forces now going on the counteroffensive. They're able, with small bands of Ukrainian fighters to go in and completely disrupt these armored columns. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Joe, thank you so much. Really great analysis there. We so appreciate it, as always. Now, Ukrainian President Zelensky's speech to Congress has helped boost U.S. support for Ukraine. Just after he spoke, President Biden was quick to commit to new military aid to Ukraine, as we were just discussing. The president announced an additional $800 million in military support and also called Russian President Vladimir Putin a war criminal. The American people will be steadfast in our support of the people of Ukraine in the face of Putin's immoral, unethical attacks on civilian populations. We are united in our abhorrence of Putin's depraved onslaught, and we're going to continue to have their backs as they fight for their freedom, their democracy, their very survival. Let's go now to NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander in Washington. Peter, good morning. So, of course, let's start with that comment from President Biden. We know the U.S. is investigating possible war crimes in right. Ukraine. Did the White House elaborate on the president calling Putin 
a war criminal. I mean, that that is, as, as a lot of us have become more comfortable understanding at this point, a, a very important distinction than just feeling that what's happening in Ukraine is this terrible thing, a war criminal. What kind of comments, what, do, what kind of weight do those comments carry? Well, this was clearly the harshest condemnation by President Biden himself of Vladimir Putin since this now three-plus-week-old war began. The White House to this point has steered clear of using uh, that phrase, war criminal. They note that there was an ongoing international and U.S. Uh, investigation into war crimes that Putin is accused of. But the White House said yesterday the president, in effect, was speaking uh, his opinion, that that's what he believes. They say those investigations are continuing. Nonetheless, Russia is pushing back on it. We heard from Dmitry Peskov, notably he is the, the press secretary, the spokesperson for Putin, describing President Biden's comments as unacceptable and unforgivable, and then following up and saying that those comments are not admissible in court. This is one of those situations that it's going to take a while to fully investigate, but it's clear based on what the world is watching from independent journalists on the ground right now and all the video that's been provided from there that civilians by heavy numbers have been the, have been the worst victims and mm -hmm. often targeted, it appears, in the course of this war. Yeah, absolutely, especially as we wait to hear the death toll from that strike in Mariupol recently. Now, Peter, the added assistance to Ukraine brings the total amount of aid to Ukraine authorized by the president to $2 billion now at this point, but the White House is still under pressure to do more. What else is in the works to aid Ukraine or, or punish Russia? Well, let's start with what the White House just announced. Of course, this was the president's response to Zelensky's uh, powerful remarks. The president said that Zelensky's speech was passionate, it was convincing, and then he detailed that $800 million of aid. It includes like 20 million rounds of ammunition, anti-aircraft equipment, anti-armor, anti-tank uh, weapons as well. To say nothing of these killer, these deadly drones that the U.S. will now be providing, what are referred to as switchblades, they can effectively target um, Russian military positions and individuals from long distances mm -hmm. away. And the U.S. is going to try to, uh, the president says, acquire some longer range mobile missile anti-aircraft systems as well to target those planes and helicopters and the cruise missiles that Russia has been using. So that's what the U.S. is doing so far. One billion dollars announced and given over just the course of the last week. The U.S. by far the biggest con uh, contributor of military aid to Ukraine. But the president notably did not make any mention of a no-fly zone. He didn't talk about the transfer, helping transfer those Polish fighter jets, Soviet-era MiG fighter jets to Ukraine that many lawmakers, mostly Republicans, have been demanding. The president, Savannah, as you know well, has warned that that would effectively spark World War III. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of back and forth, a lot of conversation and questions about that one. Peter Alexander, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Russia's attack on Ukraine has forced more than 3 million people to flee the country in just three weeks. More than 1.9 million Ukrainians have entered into Poland alone. That is higher than the entire population of Warsaw. That's the largest city in Poland. NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray joins us now from a town in Poland near the border of Ukraine. Good morning to you, Jay. We know Poland has opened its doors to the majority of Ukrainian refugees since this war began. How is the country doing in terms of handling this influx? And also talk to us about what the humanitarian workers there are doing to help. Yeah, Vicky, it's overwhelming for Poland. They've about reached their limit as far as those that can uh, stay here permanently and so other countries are, are taking part of that burden because we know a lot more refugees are on the way. You asked about the humanitarian effort. There's not one that's much better than this. I'm standing in what used to be an empty warehouse, an abandoned warehouse, no power, no water. It has been transformed by the world central kitchen into a world-class kitchen. Chefs from around the country coming in and doing what they can to provide help, provide food, nourishment uh, for those who are making that journey. And it's unbelievable just to see the process that they've uh, created here. Uh, they are cooking hot meals every day around the clock for all of these refugees. They have the ability in this warehouse alone to make 200,000 meals a day or more, and, and you can see what they're using to cook here. I mean, it's amazing to see uh, just these huge pots that continue uh, to churn out soup, continue to churn out chicken, pork, 
be things uh, that you know we don't think about a lot but those who have walked maybe two three days to get to the border with their children they they can't wait to have a hot meal and, and so they they get the process done here they, they get the cooking done here and then everything's loaded up into vans and trucks we've seen 18 wheelers here loading up food they take this food to all of the border crossings to every border crossing here and, and some across the border as well so they're really doing uh, what no one else can. They're, they're doing uh, what they do best, providing food uh, for those who have made this journey. And it's been amazing to see such a great and volunteer effort, chefs from around the world, people from around the world just gathering to try and help out those that are, are making that trip. The civilian volunteers, the professional chefs, everybody getting together. Thank you for that tour. It's really remarkable how organized it is and how quickly they were able to set up. Jay, earlier this week, the U.S. authorized $186 yeah. mil million dollars in additional humanitarian aid for Ukraine and surrounding countries. Talk to us about where this aid money goes yeah. and how the U.S. and other countries can help with this situation. Certainly food, water, shelter, all priorities. Yeah, and that's where a lot of this money is going, to organizations that are on the ground here so they can disperse uh, what they know uh, that the refugees need here. So uh, a lot of that money goes to organizations that are buying clothes, blankets, toiletries uh, for uh, those that are coming across the border. Food is another issue, as you talk about, and, and just simple things like uh, water, bread, and, and things like that. And so it's going into that. You'll see a lot of it also going into these programs to help people once they're established and, and starting to, in essence, start a new life, Vicki. And so it'll be put into getting children school supplies. It'll be put into helping job train some of these women who have come over and, and left their loved ones behind to fight. And so we're seeing that start to progress now. In fact, Poland yesterday began issuing ID cards to those who are staying for extended time in Poland. It'll give them a chance to uh, register their kids for school, to get health insurance through the government here, to uh, get a job. It'll make it easier to get a job. And, and so we're seeing that process start to unfold, and that's where a lot of that funding goes. So many logistical needs as well, and hopefully getting those kids back in school, some normalcy for them. Jay Gray, thank you so much. Well, we will have more coverage on the war in Ukraine throughout the hour, but we are also following other news for you this morning. Yeah, when we come back, a free man, actor Jesse Smollett, out from behind bars after his conviction for lying to police about a staged hate crime. We'll break down what's next in his case. And one cup at a time, the new plan by Starbucks to reduce waste, plus other environmental headlines in this week's Climate Control. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. More of our coverage of the war in Ukraine coming up, but we want to get to some of the other stories making news this morning right now. And we're going to start with Jesse Smollett. He's a free man this morning after a court agreed with his lawyers that the actor should be released as he waits for the appeal of his conviction for lying to police about a staged hate crime. Joining us now to break all this down is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalo. Danny, good morning. So first, I want to play some of what Smollett's attorney said, Shay Allen, after the $150,000 bond was posted last night, and we'll talk on the other side. I think we're here because the appellate court realized this was the right thing to do. I hope everyone realizes that the, the persecution that went on in that courthouse was absurd and that the sentence was a draconian sentence. It was excessive. Danny, do you agree with that assessment, and what do you make of the court's decision here to, to allow him to be out? The key here is the fact that the sentence was really only about 150 days, uh, and that is a short period of time, which is critical in most courts when they decide to release someone pending an appeal. And the idea behind that is that uh, if they don't release someone with a very short sentence, then they could complete the sentence uh, before the appeals heard, and then winning the appeal becomes hollow. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a bit paradoxical, but if you have a very short sentence, you have a better chance of getting bail uh, pending that appeal because mm -hmm. of the short sentence. And, of course, they raise an interesting double jeopardy issue. Now, Smollett's lawyers criticized the special prosecutor's decision to charge the actor a second time. If everybody remembers, this is after the charges were initially dropped. 
by the Cook County State Attorney. Walk us through that and then also tell us, do they have a case here by criticizing that decision to, to pursue it again? They might have a double jeopardy issue here. This could be Bill Cosby 2, uh, the sequel in a sense. And the reason I say that is that uh, Bill Cosby was released because uh, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania found that there was a previous agreement not to prosecute Cosby. So prosecuting him violated his right. Mm -hmm. Essentially, that's the argument here. Smollett saying, hey, the first time around, I did this community service. I paid some money. And the idea was this case was over. Then in swoops this special prosecutor, and I get charged after I thought, hey, I'm in the clear. It's an interesting double jeopardy issue. And I, I am certain, even though the court issued a one-page order, that, that uh, they must have thought that, not that necessarily it'll be successful, but that it has a shot. Note mm. that this double jeopardy issue has nothing to do with the merits of the case. Smollett doesn't even appear to be arguing the merits, just really this double jeopardy issue and a couple other issues. Right. That, that's interesting that you point that out, that it's not actually about what did or did not happen. It's about this legal process. I mean, how do you ultimately see this playing out in the end? Uh, for criminal defense attorneys, who cares if uh, <laughs> the merits of the case aren't the reason that your client is exonerated or set free? Mm. So uh, it goes up on appeal. The double jeopardy argument might even be stronger. In fact, I guarantee it's stronger than if you just challenged uh, the jury's conclusion on the facts. That kind of challenge is rarely successful. So this is an interesting constitutional issue. And uh, if I were the appellate lawyers, I'd be waving the Bill Cosby uh, Supreme Court of Pennsylvania mm. flag in my appeal. Danny Savalos, this is why it is so great to have you on our team to walk us through these types of things. Thank you so much. Good to see you. We are learning new details this morning about that fatal crash in Texas involving the University of Southwest men's and women's golf teams. Nine people were killed. Another two were seriously hurt in Tuesday's accident. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now from Hobbs, New Mexico. That's where the school is located. Morgan, good morning. We have Vicki, good morning. And you talk to anyone in this community or by this campus, and you keep hearing the same word, and that is devastated. And here at their home course that the team played at just a few days ago, there's a growing memorial to pay tribute to those young lives lost, along with their coach, all of them killed in an accident. That's now under investigation. Heartbreak this morning in Hobbs, New Mexico, following a horrific head-on collision that took the lives of nine people, including seven members of a college golf team. Gary and Sandy Rains lost their daughter, Carissa, just 21 years old, a biology major and devout Christian. Carissa was my baby, and I don't know what I'm going to do without her. The accident happened just after 8 p.m. Tuesday on a remote farm road north of Midland, Texas. Authorities say the team from the University of the Southwest was returning from a tournament when a pickup truck crossed over into their lane. Authorities say that head-on collision grew worse when flames engulfed both vehicles. Burn scars now line the side of the road where bystanders tried desperately to save those trapped inside. We are going to need two helicopters, please. Rescue crews airlifted two students more than 100 miles to Lubbock, Texas, where both remain in critical condition. But six student athletes, their coach and two others inside the pickup truck, lost their lives. Ben Kirks, the pro at the local golf course, worked closely with the team and helped create a hometown memorial to pay tribute. Life shouldn't be taken for granted. and you, know, you should really hold on to those you love. Among them, Lacey Stone, whose high school teacher called her a hardworking student and golfer who always found a reason to smile. There was never a dull moment with Lacey. She joked and she sang and she just lived life to the fullest. We are praying so much for the families of all those other kids. Young lives full of promise, leaving many families struggling to heal. Right now, we just keep thinking every. Once in a while, we're going to wake up from this terrible nightmare, but it's it's not happening. Mm, yeah, so tough for so many. Uh, and we do know that the University of the Southwest was playing a golf tournament in Midland prior to this tragedy. The final round of that tournament was canceled. Uh, and in response, the head coach of Midland College left the scores up from the USW players on that board. He says to pay tribute to the great young people along with their coach, Vicki. Morgan, such a tragedy. Our hearts are with those families and that community. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Now, a 7.3 magnitude earthquake hit the coast of eastern Japan last night, killing at least four people and injuring more than 100 others. It hit near Fukushima, the site of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami that caused a nuclear plant meltdown. Now, a tsunami advisory was issued soon after yesterday's quake, but was lifted early this morning. In this week's climate control, we are looking at the state of the Amazon rainforest. Yes, satellite data shows deforestation in Brazil reaching record levels. It comes as a new study warns that the Amazon is approaching a tipping point it couldn't come back from. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens is back with us for the segment. Hey, Bill, great to have you back this hour. So Brazil is one of the 100 plus countries actually that pledged to halt or reverse deforestation at last year's COP26 climate summit. So tell us what we're learning, though, from the country's own space agency. What are we seeing is actually happening in the Amazon? Yeah, good morning. And when they made that agreement and they signed on, a lot of people doubted that Brazil would actually follow through with this. So unfortunately, this isn't coming as a surprise to mm. many. So first off, why is the Brazilian rainforest so important? Well, it produces 6% of the world's oxygen. Obviously, mm. we need oxygen. And there are 390 billion trees that absorb the CO2. And they, you know, about 60% of the rainforest remaining on our planet are all in Brazil. So that's why ever there's so much focus on the Amazon. And so for one of the first times ever, they actually studied using satellites to actually look down into the tree canopy to kind of see the health of the rainforest. And what they found was that about only about 70 percent of it now is is not healthy. It doesn't have the ability to reinvent itself the way it used to. So and one of the biggest reasons why is because of cattle ranching and mm. deforestation. So for food is why they are cutting down the trees. Um, and a lot of they're doing it, they clear cut it with fires. And so the, what they found in January and February was that 166 square miles were cleared. That's two times the average over the past decade. And that's about the size of Chicago, or if you've ever been to New York City Central Park, it's 126 central parks that have been cleared just in the first two months of this year. So an alarming rate, especially since they just signed on saying that they were going to reverse the process. And if people are wondering kind of why this has changed recently, well, in 2019, the president of Brazil was elected saying that they were going to use the resources of the rainforest to help with the economy of Brazil. Um, so this doesn't come to any surprise, mm. but it's alarming because we need it to capture the carbon right. for all the CO2 that we're producing. We need um, it as a world, also the country of Brazil. It's balancing yeah. humans with nature. Yeah. Talk to us, Bill. Are there any efforts to help restore the trees that are being lost to all of this deforestation? It comes down to a math equation. We need to incentivize the rainforest and actually pay money to keep it mm -hmm. that is more than, say, the farmers will make for their cattle or for they'll make for their plantations or the crops. And the reason why is because the Amazon is what climate scientists call a tipping point, kind of similar to the ice in the Arctic or the ice sheets on Greenland or the Gulf Stream current in the Atlantic. There are certain tipping points in our planetary system that we're concerned that once they change, they can never be reversed. So they're racing to figure out when this point of no return is. And this is a separate study that was done by Nature Climate uh, a change. And they said that 75% of the Amazon is less resilient now. It means they're more prone to fires. And the concern is with not just little fires, but mega fires could begin in the Amazon with, uh -huh. uh, in the future because of less rainfall. And that in the last, uh, since 2005, there's been three droughts in the Amazon that have been considered one in 100 year droughts. And those are becoming more common. And more droughts mm -hmm. means the rainforests are more vulnerable. Bill, quickly, before we let you go, we do want to ask you about one that will impact a lot of people. We hear Starbucks has a new plan to tackle its waste. What more can you tell us about that? When you think of Starbucks, you think of you know their iconic cups and yeah. their logos. And on, t on Tuesday, Starbucks came out and they said, by the end of next year, no more single-use paper cups. So that makes you wonder, well, how are they going to do mm -hmm. this? Well, they're saying that they will provide or you will bring in your own reusable cup 
You will bring it into the store. They will refill it. You will bring it home. You will clean it. And then you will bring it back the next day. And this will be by the end of next year. So think about every it. store that they have, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And this is a part of their sustainability plan by 2030 that for a planet positive goal. So wow. that's a big change. And they that want is. this to be something not just for their store, but right. they're thinking big. They want, you know, maybe that cup that you use, not just as used at their restaurant, but other restaurants, too. So you can kind of picture you'll have that cup or two of your own, and you'll use it everywhere. With you everywhere. It is yeah. smart marketing. It's great for the planet. I'm so excited yeah. to see them roll this out. The trash alone in New York City <sighs> from people just drinking a cup of coffee and tossing it out, how yeah. much that will and cut down on. it's so cool to see, like, a big commercial yeah. business yes, making a decision exactly. like this. exactly. Hopefully that, others follow. Yeah, exactly. All right, Bill, thank you. We love, love, love climate control. Thanks, Thanks. for coming back with us. And coming up on Morning News Now, education amid the uncertainty. Up next, how teachers are working to keep Ukraine's children learning even in a time of war. And the beat goes on. Listen to how Ukraine's musicians are using their art to provide comfort through all this chaos after the break. Welcome back. Another major airline says it will no longer fly over Russian airspace over concerns about the war in Ukraine. Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with the latest on that and more global reaction to the war. Good morning, Claudio. Good morning, guys. Yes, Cathay, um, Cathay Pacific Airways has joined a, a growing number of Asian airlines that stopped uh, flying over Russia. Now, the Hong Kong-based airline is not among uh, those that are banned right now uh, by uh, Russia. But at the same time, in a statement, it said that its planes are avoiding Russian airspace. OPS Group, an organization that assesses and shares information on flight risks, says that many airliners are avoiding Russia right now because the risks of landing near in an emergency is currently too high. And in other news, the economic effect of the war in Ukraine is being felt in the Middle East, to the point that many have started panicking on social media about the rising price and the, short, and the shortage of wheat, sunflower oil and fuel, essential goods typically imported from Ukraine and Russia. As the war in Ukraine rages on, Egypt has banned the export of flour and wheat to protect its food reserves. And after a Russian journalist staged a brave protest against the war in Ukraine during a live news broadcast on Monday, more resignations from state-controlled Russian channels have come to light. Channel 1's Europe correspondent, as well as two other high-profile journalists from a Russian channel NTV, have recently resigned, and more are expected to follow, guys. Mm. All right. That's, a statement. Yeah, exactly. And, and maybe a way to get more true information to the people of Russia. Claudio, thank you so much. Now, more than one and a half million children have joined the exodus from Ukraine. And get this, that's a rate of almost one child per second, according to UNICEF. And amid the chaos and horror, the country's teachers are doing everything they can to keep their children's education going. We want to bring in one of those teachers, one of those heroes, quite frankly, Alexandra Savchenko. Alexandra, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. So first, just, I mean, how are you doing this? What is class like? Tell us about how you're able to try to keep something normal going for these children during a time that is so abnormal and so scary. How are you doing class right now? Well, for now, we have an online process, and uh, it was something that we already ready for it because of pandemia. Mm. Uh, and yeah, first in the first day when the war started in Kyiv, because I'm a teacher from Kyiv, so we understood that uh, kids and parents are need us, and we need them mm -hmm. to be with each other, to communicate, just to say hello, to stand back, to just like support. And few first days, uh, those who want it and can. Uh, be online, mm -hmm. started the process. We tried to read with all together, to work with the fakes and facts uh, in the articles that they're going around uh, the kids. And we worked with um, information about what can we manage with the stress, uh, what happened with our body, psychology, and et cetera, and how Will help to each other. For now, for this week, we already have a uh, like almost a full program that we continue to uh, work with them because kids kids are adaptive. 
mm-hmm. more than us, yeah. adults. Oh, I know. I guess that that is something that's a little bit of good news that they can adapt in a in a quick way. But they are literally running for their lives, leaving the only country they've probably ever known, leaving their homes, in some cases, leaving family and friends. How are they responding to your lessons? I mean, what are you seeing in them about how they're handling this? And does this seem like a distraction that that's nice for them? Well, it's something that we cannot, um, I don't know, to say for now. Uh, we will work with this post-trauma after. And uh, we already have some unnormal situation when some of our kids still in Kiev sitting uh, during the lesson and uh, asking about the pause because there are bombs outside. So it's already something really um, that makes me in shock sometimes. But uh, some of kids um, still are not ready to, to be they just like um, they just really close to their parents, they close to them, themselves. Some of them are still on the way somewhere to be in a safety place in Europe. Um, but yeah, we still have some somebody who are ready to be online. Absolutely. Uh, it's just such an important reminder, I think, too, for uh, us in other parts of the world that, you know, you think about a disruption to your child going to school and how much of a disruption to their entire lives is happening to all the children of Ukraine. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us. It's incredible what you're doing. Please stay safe and we'd love to check in with you. We so appreciate our teachers. They are heroes on a good day, let alone during war. Yeah. Well, on the streets of Lviv, musicians are also doing their part, their art providing a lot of needed relief from the sounds of war. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter listened in, and she brings us their stories. Far from the front line, this city's soundtrack is different here in the West. The Lviv Philharmonic Orchestra is giving it everything they've got. 33-year-old Daniel, grateful to play. A little gift, a little um, sunny shine in heart. You see the yeah, sunshine yeah, in their heart. Yeah. And like so many young Ukrainian men, next week might look different. If uh, our army uh, will need my hands and uh, my heart, i ready. Musicians here, some residents, some new arrivals, fighting in their own way. Music producer Maxime in the black fled the eastern city of Kharkiv about a week ago. And around the corner, 31-year-old Paul is donating all his tips to the military. There are lots of ways to support your country, and this is how you're doing it right now. Yes, and I, I can play, I played. This is also the sound of a country at war. Molly Hunter, NBC News, Lviv. Amazing. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, Puerto Rico now out of bankruptcy. Nearly seven years after saying it couldn't pay $70 billion in debt. More on the largest public debt restructuring in U.S. history. And what happens next? And in need of a pep talk, a group of kindergartners has got you covered. Their words of encouragement now just one phone call away. And we're back. It's time for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Bertha Coombs is here with us in her St. Patrick's Day green. Hey, Bertha, good morning. <laughs> hey, good morning, Vicki and Savannah. Uh, so it doesn't look like we're going to see a whole lot of green, at least not at the open on Wall Street. Uh, maybe a bit of profit taking here as investors digest the Federal Reserve's latest move. Markets initially dipped yesterday when the Fed announced its first rate hike since 2018 and signaled that there are likely going to be six more hikes this year. The Fed also raising its projections for inflation for 2022. But stocks picked up once Fed Chairman Jerome Powell began his post-meeting news conference. He said, look, the economy is strong. It can withstand this. And investors appear to be taking those aggressive changes to rein in inflation in stride right now. The Dow closing up more than 500 points. The S&P 500 gaining about 2.5% yesterday. The Nasdaq jumped nearly 4%. Historically, markets actually do well after the first Fed rate hike, with an average gain of about 9% for the S&P over the following 12 months. 
months. Meantime, oil prices are back on the rise, reversing three straight days of losses. The move coming after the International Energy Agency warns that the market could lose 3 million barrels per day of Russian crude and refined products uh, in April by April. Still, since hitting a high around $130 a barrel on March 9th, U.S. crude is down about 20 percent. Still. You may not see immediate relief at the gas pump as there's usually a few days lag between oil and retail gas prices. The war in Ukraine could impact global car production, though. S&P Global Mobility cutting its forecast for light vehicle output by more than 2 million units over the next two years. The conflict is added to supply and logistics problems, as well as shortages of critical parts. Many automakers source wire harnesses from Ukraine. They're used to uh, primarily for electric power and communication between parts. Volkswagen and BMW have been the most impacted automakers so far. This is really a time when supply chain situation is just so fragile. Back over to you guys. Bertha, thanks so much, and happy St. Patrick's Day. I like how you wove green into your yeah, that report was funny. There. That was funny. I think our mics were down, but we both laughed. Thanks, Bertha. Good to see you. Now, nearly seven years after announcing it was unable to pay its debts, Puerto Rico has now formally exited bankruptcy, completing the largest public debt restructuring in U.S. history. NBC News digital reporter Nicole Acevedo joins us now with the latest. Hey, Nicole, good morning. So walk us through this in uh, as layman's terms as possible here, because we keep on throwing around these terms, public this restructuring and everything. So help everybody understand that when it entered bankruptcy, Puerto Rico owed $70 billion, and it was actually spending 25 cents of every taxpayer dollar on debt service. What are some of the takeaways from this new plan and, and how it all worked out? Well, this new plan that was put into effect this week was approved earlier this year. And essentially what it did is that it reduced the biggest chunk of that $70 billion debt, which was incurred by the central government. So you're talking about nearly cutting down $33 billion of that central government debt down to $7 billion. And what that did was consequently reducing annual repayments to bondholders that own that debt. So instead of paying close to $4 billion, now they will be paying a little bit more than $1 billion, meaning that seven cents of every taxpayer dollar that Puerto Ricans give will go to that repayment. Mm. Now, since 2016, Puerto Rico's finances have actually been controlled by a federal oversight board, which has imposed strict measures. What does this deal mean for ordinary people on the island, for taxpayers? Well, aside from, you know, that a, a chunk of, of what you pay every year in taxes is going to go to that debt service, what it also means is that Puerto Ricans need to remain vigilant. Um, the board is projecting that if the economy does as well as they're expecting, that by 2034, they're going to be able to pay this debt. However, if the past five years have taught Puerto Ricans anything, is that Life is full of curveballs. And during one of the largest, most disastrous hurricanes, unprecedented earthquakes, a pandemic. So I think that if those scenarios change, we might have to go back to the drawing board and restructure that debt again which is not only a costly process, but mm. a time-consuming one. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this deal, though, doesn't resolve all of Puerto Rico's debt issues. Its power company, its transportation authority are both still in bankruptcy proceedings. What's the latest with that? That one is going to be a little tricky, particularly the one with the power company, because the money, the revenue stream that's going to service that debt comes from the electric bill Puerto Ricans will receive every year, meaning that Puerto Ricans will feel it more in their pockets. So you're you're going to see a, little, a lot of more back and forth in that one. It's also the agency with the largest public debt. They own about $9 billion. And in a country that, you know, pays already double for electric service, unreliable electric service, the possibility that that could change and be more expensive to service this debt it's something that's concerning Puerto Ricans. And again, they will remain vigilant about it. All right, Nicole, thank you so much. Well, if you have been feeling angry, frustrated, or nervous, just know you're not alone. There is a group of elementary school students with some very positive messages. All you have to do is dial their number. <laughs> 
you're feeling mad, frustrated, or nervous, press 1. If you're nervous, go get your wallet and spend it on ice cream and shoes. Move over, cold calls and doom scrolling. There's a new trend in positivity, accessible right from your cell phone. Welcome to the Pep Talk Hotline. Real advice you can use from the students at Westside Elementary in Healdsburg, California. If you feel mad or frustrated, you can do what you want to do best, or you can do flips on the trampoline. The hotline is the brainchild of Westside art teacher Jessica Martin and local artist Ashera Weiss, inspired by the positivity their students have shown over the last few years. It's been a hard few years. I, we've been listening to the advice that you have and, and everything you do to help yourself and your friends and your family feel better. And we'd like to share that with the world. So that's what they did, starting small with posters. Never back down, never give up. We love you. But like any good campaign, the kids wanted to meet people where they are, naturally, on their phones. We're on our screens all day. And um, to actually pick up a phone and talk to someone or listen to someone is very rare, actually. If you need words of encouragement and life advice, press 2. If you're feeling up high and unbalanced, think of groundhogs. Fifth grader Matisse is proud of his contribution to the hotline. I did the, if you're feeling high and unbalanced, think of groundhogs, because I thought it would be a little funny thing, play on words, and it would make people smile. He says when it comes to encouragement, kids just do it better. No offense, but I feel like kids' voices can be better at encouraging than adults' voices. They're just like, I don't know. <laughs> It is better. It's that perspective that has the pep talk hotline ringing off the hook. Two days after we, we went live, we were getting 500 calls an hour. <laughs> and uh, at last I checked, we were getting 11,000 calls an hour. So it's absolutely extraordinary. Ten-year-old so Liam says the hotline welcome. meets a critical need. It's so stressful right now because the U Russia and Ukraine war, COVID, and loss of family members. It's pretty sad. I'm always happy, but then my mom, she comes home from work, and she's just stressed, and I don't like that. I'm like, Mom, press number two, listen to the little kids. You will be fine in an hour. A few words from kids now reaching adults around the world. I think for them to understand one little small word, one sentence, look how it's impacting so many lives all across the world. So take it from Liam, we could all use a pep talk. Just with one word of encouragement, you might have a great day afterward. I mean, the kid who's like, it just sounds better. No offense, grown-ups, oh, but it it's just more encouraging yeah. when we say stuff. It's yeah. kind of true. Oh, my gosh. And then you can have a great day. Exactly. Go buy some shoes. Jump on the trampoline. <laughs> that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.